in the shrouded vastness of Canada's Gaspé Peninsula, where the dense forest stretched like a dark cloak across the land, a gruesome discovery broke the uneasy silence. The headless remains of the first of three missing men was discovered deep in the rugged landscape of the Canadian wilderness. This is a place that carries the echoes of nature's ancient laws and the murmur of the St. Lawrence River's tides. In the summer of 1953, the Gaspé's timeless serenity was shattered when three American hunters ventured into the deadly embrace of its wilderness. The Americans stepped into a place that holds its secrets close, a land where the mist veils more than the gnarled trees and rugged terrain. For some, it cloaks very gruesome ends. The disappearance of the three American hunters stirred the waters of speculation and fear, leading to a series of discoveries that turned this majestic landscape into a macabre canvas of sickening triple murder. As this gritty tale of a Northman turned psycho killer unfolds, the Gaspé's haunting beauty becomes the backdrop for a case that continues to perplex and chill to this day. This is a place where superstition, mountains, hiking, and the beautiful outdoors serve as a backdrop to dreadful murder. As we will soon see, sometimes the most disturbing fates don't come from the creatures that lurk in the woods, but rather the darkness that resides in the human heart. In this case of murder and in the two that follow it, we need not fear the inhuman beasts of the woods, but rather the human killers who stalk and murder their very human prey within the misty concealment of nature's wilderness. As with all of the cases we cover, I'm dreadfully curious. The graphic content ahead may be disturbing to some. Viewer discretion is advised. On June 5, 1953, Eugene Lindsay experienced hunter and patriarch, along with his young son, 17-year-old Richard, fresh from the triumphs of high school graduation, and their companion, 20-year-old Frederick Clare, were departing Pennsylvania in the United States and readying themselves for a rite of passage into the wilderness on Canada's Gaspé Peninsula. They didn't know it yet, but this hunting party had embarked on an expedition of murder where they were the prey. On July 15, 1953, the headless remains of Eugene Lindsay were discovered deep in the rugged landscape of the Canadian wilderness. In the days that followed, the remains of Richard and Fred were also discovered in the same area. The remains of all three were found fleshless, for the most part, bare gnawed bones were all that remained of these three victims. The crime scene was large and growing, human bones scattered about, bits of chewed clothing, chewed up watch that was believed to belong to Fred, and other possessions were found chewed on and strewn about by the wildlife, mainly bears. The initial search yielded only one head, and reporting at the time indicates suspicion that bears had consumed and carried off the two missing heads. How to almost anyone, this could easily be assessed as an adventure gone wrong. Perhaps these men out hunting bears had themselves experienced a terrible and fatal, if not poetic, bear attack. Surely such things can and do happen. However, closer inspection of the scene revealed a white sweatshirt, which added a chilling realization to this case. The white sweatshirt had the words Holidaysburg Tigers on it. The mascot to Holidaysburg, Pennsylvania High School, Richard's school. The sweatshirt was stained with blood and had a small circular hole in it, a bullet hole. So indeed, the bones of these victims had been broken, gnawed on, and dragged about by bears. But the animal that killed these three men was human. At least one of this trio was shot, which supports with near certainty that all three met their end by murder. Let's look more deeply at the traditions and sentiments that drew these three American men to their untimely demise in the Canadian wilderness. The tradition of American hunters venturing into Canada for game hunting dates back to the 19th century, and actually even earlier. Canada's vast and varied wilderness has always been a draw for hunters seeking larger game and a more pristine hunting environment. This was especially attractive during the era of conservation movement in the United States, which began in the late 19th century, as it brought restrictions and regulations to preserve wildlife populations within the United States. Canada's more lenient regulations and abundant game made it a favored destination for American sportsmen. Moreover, the ritual of the hunt has deep roots in many cultures, often seen as a rite of passage or an opportunity to return to a more rugged and self-reliant way of life, if only temporarily. For many Americans, hunting in Canada is a way to experience the wilderness in a way that can be more challenging to execute in the United States due to urbanization and habitat loss. Geographical distance can also add to the allure and the adventure. Today, hunting in Canada remains popular among American hunters for several reasons, including the opportunity to pursue species not found in the U.S., the allure of the Canadian wilderness, and the tradition and camaraderie that such trips often entail. Hunting outfitters and guide services in Canada have become a significant industry, catering to visitors seeking these experiences. Eugene, Richard, and Fred had cash on hand and were well supplied for their adventure. Their packs were filled with provisions and gear, the weight of which was no doubt a comforting assurance against the unpredictability of nature. As they loaded their vehicle, the anticipation of the hunt was palpable. 
shared excitement tinged with the primal call of the wilderness. They were about to immerse themselves in the Gaspé's sprawling embrace, unaware that the forest canopy they ventured under held in store for them a gruesome case of true crime and murder. A true crime case that remains mysterious in some ways, even today. The trio intended to spend two weeks away on their hunting adventure. When their date of return came and went without a word from any of the men, inquiries were made and a search began. With the finding of the bloodstained sweatshirt with a bullet hole in it, other signs of foul play, police now knew they had a murder on their hands. They worked to unmask the man or men that perpetrated the killing of these three Americans. Wilbert Coffin, 41 years old, was a well-regarded military veteran, handyman, laborer, and prospector. He was very well liked. Coffin became identified as the person who last saw the hunting party alive. Coffin was seen by witnesses on June 10. It appears he had been giving young Richard a ride into town for parts for the murdered trio's car, which had broken down. Police got in touch with Coffin some 500 miles away by phone and asked for him to return to Gaspé for an interview. He, as an innocent man would, agreed. Wilbur, the witness, confirms that he had seen and interacted with the Americans. On June 10, Wilbur Coffin happened to cross the Lindsay party. The car broke down 60 miles west of town. He offered to help, nice guy that he is, and he took one of the men to town to purchase a new pump for their car. When they returned, he says two more Americans in a Jeep had pulled up and were conversing with the party. Coffin helped with the pump and says the Lindsay party gave him 40 US dollars for his assistance. He then left for one of his copper mining claims, but says he passed by that same spot two days later and noticed the Jeep was gone, but the Lindsay party's car from Pennsylvania remained. He didn't see anyone around the vehicle at that time. The details offered by Coffin were initially believed and helped add detail to the timeline for police. However, the situation changed when it was discovered that Coffin was or had been in possession of several items belonging to the deceased. You see, the police had of course done what it is that police do. They followed up on timelines and corroborated details. Trust but verify. Mr. Wilbert Coffin's helpful story did not hold up under scrutiny. Was Wilbert the witness actually Wilbert the backwoods butcher? Time would tell. Rhoda Coffin Stanley, sister to Wilbur Coffin, let slip to police that on or about June 10, her brother paid her a visit. He had a bag of clothes he claimed the Americans had gifted to him. Wilbur's story crumbles further when police learn that he left Gaspé for Montreal shortly after the June 10 encounter with the Lindsay party. There he visits his common-law wife, Marianne Petrie, or Mrs. Marianne Petrie Coffin, as she prefers to go by. This was Wilbert's better half and mother to the also present son to Wilbert, James, who was five years old. Good old dad, Wilbert, gave his son a pair of binoculars and a hunting knife. He also sold an oil lamp and an automatic pistol that would later be identified as belonging to Eugene Lindsay to his lady's brother. He also gave his girlfriend the bag of clothing he had shown his sister. Guess what else Wilbert is said to have had with him in Montreal? That pump that he'd supposedly helped the Lindsays install on their vehicle. Of course, this didn't look good, and Wilbert was arrested and charged with murder. He was confined for 11 months until a special session of the Court of Queen's Bench was held in a small fishing village south of Gaspé. Crown alleged that Wilbert robbed and murdered the Lindsay party on or around June 10, 1953. They also alleged that he dismembered them, disarticulating their bodies so that the bears would help dispose of their remains. Dr. Roussel, a pathologist, testified that a perforation on the pelvic bone of Fred was made by a bullet. Furthermore, evidence presented indicated that 17-year-old Richard was shot from behind by someone in an elevated position. The pathologist stated that the bullet ripped through Richard's left lung with such force it had spun him around as he fell to the ground. Firearm evidence, primitive by today's standards, was offered as circumstantially linking the likely caliber of the murder weapon with a rifle that Coffin had access to at the time of the murders. Witnesses were called that described Coffin in the days after his encounter with the Lindsay party as a man behaving as if he'd just come into some money. He bought people booze, treated himself to a haircut, and drank like a fish. He tipped surprisingly well, too. His spending far exceeded the $40 supposedly given to him by the murdered Americans. A total of 85 witnesses were called by the prosecution. Family, police, woodsmen, and townsfolk all helped build a compelling circumstantial case of murder against Mr. Wilbur Coffin. Then the prosecution rested their case. Now, the defense's turn. But in a bit of a shocker, they called no witnesses. Not their client, the accused, not their own experts, not anyone. This is interesting and was reported as quite surprising at the time, but it's actually not an unheard of strategy. 
The decision to rest a case without calling witnesses is often a calculated move by the defense, predicated on the belief that the prosecution has not proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Since the burden of proof is supposedly on the prosecution, the defense may conclude that presenting their own evidence could introduce new risks without being necessary. It's a strategy that hinges on the strength or perceived weakness of the prosecution's case rather than the defense's ability to counter it with its own evidence. Other concerns can be present too. Every witness called by the defense can be cross-examined by the prosecution, which in some cases may do more harm than good, especially if there's a risk of the witness being discredited. Additionally, if the defendant is at risk for self-incrimination, the defense might choose not to put them on the stand at all. Regardless of exactly why, Wilbert Coffin and his defense team rested their case without any witnesses. The jury deliberated for only 34 minutes before returning the verdict of guilty. As the judge handed down the sentence, he reportedly put on black gloves, a symbol of mourning while delivering the grimmest of news, the sentence of death. In the judge's words, the jury has returned a verdict of guilty of murder. I have no alternative but to pass upon you the sentence of death, which the law imposes. Coffin made many appeals and received seven separate stays of execution. The evidence used to convict was completely circumstantial. His common law wife had been inappropriately forced to testify and other legal issues were debated. His supporters said new evidence was found. Witnesses who saw the Jeep mentioned by Coffin on or around June 10 came forward. A new narrative from the condemned too. He stole the belongings found in his possession, not from murdered victims, but rather from the American's hunting camp while it was unoccupied. As his supporters would put it, thief maybe, but murderer never. Reporting of the time indicates that at one point, Coff and the condemned fashioned an intricately carved fake gun out of a bar of soap and escaped from jail. His attorney convinced him to turn himself in. He reportedly sobbed apologetically for his actions, stating that he had escaped wanting to prove his innocence. On February 10, 1956, Coffin was executed by hanging. As the executioner put the black hood over his face, he smiled. His drop was 12 feet and his death was reported as instant. But that's not the end of this case. In 1991, a man by the name of Jean-Gabriel Cabot allegedly tells his siblings that he witnessed their father, Philippe Cabot, murder three American hunters when he was eight years old. Random and unexpected. This tidbit of a revelation would take years to unravel further. In 1992, police make attempts to secure a statement from Jean-Gabriel. Then in 1998, Philippe Cabot dies. His death results in revelations and even alleged confirmations from some within the Cabot family that Philippe Cabot, not Wilbert Coffin, murdered the American hunters. In a jarring memory, the family recalls an encounter between Philippe Cabot and his daughter that occurred during a family gathering where the news story of the Coffin case was mentioned. Cabot reacted by laughing hysterically and showing an unusual infatuation with the story. He even went so far as to state that they had the wrong man. His reaction was particularly chilling but this was a chilling man. Philippe Cabot is reported as a brutal and hard-drinking man, a father of eight who died with a dark reputation. Family members believe he was the real perpetrator of the savage massacre of the three Pennsylvanian hunters in 1953, a crime for which another man, Wilbert Coffin, was wrongfully hanged. Cabot's own children describe him as a man who could be jovially proud on occasions like his daughter's wedding day, yet carried a sinister secret as he boasted about the authorities hanging the wrong person. This duality paints a picture of a man who's capable of both a certain charm and a terrifying violence, leaving a legacy of fear and silence among his children. Here's a very second-hand account of what occurred. Cabot became aware of the Americans' hunting trip and that they were carrying cash. He, with eight-year-old son Jean Gabriel, in tow, drove into the bush and located Eugene and his truck. He then proceeded to bash Eugene in the head with his rifle and then ran over him several times with his truck. Further on, Cabot then shot Eugene's son Richard and family friend Fred twice in the back. 42 years after convicted killer, Wilbert Coffin was executed for the triple murder. Another man died, who at least according to some, was the real Gaspé killer. Transitioning from the Gaspé Peninsula, moving along the northeastern tip of the Appalachian region southward, along the eastern seaboard of the United States, brings us to another chilling scene in the forest. The decomposing body of a young woman tied to a tree in Freetown Fall River State Forest in Bristol County, Massachusetts. The Freetown Fall River State Forest is a part of the larger southeastern Massachusetts Bioreserve, which spans approximately 14,000 acres. This extensive area includes state forest land, municipal areas, and land managed by conservation organizations. It's a significant habitat featuring a variety of ecosystems and is managed for various uses, including wildlife conservation, recreation, and forestry. 
It is not a national park, but rather a state forest that hosts a variety of recreational activities, conservation efforts, and habitats for wildlife within the southeastern mass bioreserve. The area is also recognized for its importance to bird conservation and supports a diversity of other flora and fauna. This area is steeped in paranormal rumors and history and is part of the Bridgewater Triangle, known for sightings of UFOs, ghosts, and other anomalies. Landmarks like Profile Rock are central to its ghostly tales, contributing to its reputation as a magnet for both the outdoor enthusiasts and seekers of the supernatural. This forest embodies a haunting intersection of natural splendor and eerie legends, inviting exploration by day and caution by night. Some pretty nefarious happenings are believed to have transpired here. For instance, at one point several paths in the forest commonly used for dirt bikes were found to have thin wires covertly stretched across them, the potential motive being pretty horrific, decapitating fast-moving and unsuspecting riders. I even come across mention of an escaped emu run wild attacking people in this area. Yikes. This is a place of intriguing mysteries and dark history. On November 11, 1978, a Saturday, two young teenagers on dirt bikes were riding through the Freetown State Park and Forest when they came across a jarring and horrific scene. A human body, female, was, or rather had been, upright in a standing position tied to a tree. She was thoroughly restrained, ligatures on both her wrists and around her neck. The young woman was in a significant state of decomposition which made immediate identification impossible. The next day, Sunday, state pathologist Dr. Ambrose Keeley conducted a preliminary autopsy. The cause of death could not be initially determined and the identity of the woman couldn't be confirmed. However, he did indicate that she had not been stabbed or shot. There were no detectable wounds given the state of decomposition. She had been out there for a long while. It also appeared as though she was alive when her wrists and neck were tied to the tree. Then on Monday, November 13, 1978, another autopsy was performed that confirmed both the identity of the woman and also some chilling details about her murder in the woods. The cause of death was determined to be strangulation via ligature or positional asphyxia. She was alive and in a standing position when she was tied to the tree by her murderer. She was left there alive to wait death alone. As would befall any human, exposure, exhaustion, and dehydration will lead to weakness and unconsciousness. Since she was restrained and tied at both her wrists and neck when she became unconscious, the weight of her head tightened the ligature against her neck. This caused her to suffocate to death. Through dental records, her identity was revealed. Her name was Mary Lou Aruda. She was 15 years old. Mary Lou had gone missing two months earlier, triggering a desperate search for the girl that failed to resolve her painful disappearance. Even when she initially went missing, there was little doubt she had met with foul play. Mary Lou was last seen at about 4 o'clock on the afternoon of September 8, 1978, riding her bike near her home. At 4.30 p.m., her discarded bicycle was found lying on the side of the road. A Benson & Hedges cigarette was found discarded, and on the road, an acceleration mark and tire impression were also visible. Some witnesses came forward as well and reported seeing a bright green car with a dark racing stripe on it in the area. Police were also able to obtain a rough description of the driver. Reporting of the time indicates police had several possible suspects, but following the discovery of Mary Lou, one man came into very clear focus. James Cater. Mr. James Cater was from Brockton, Massachusetts and managed a donut shop. Cater's looked like the composite sketch of the suspect seen in the area, and he drove a green 1976 Opal with a black racing stripe, making him very likely who witnesses saw in the area at the time of the abduction. Cater, his wife, and his lawyer did meet with police, of course denying completely any and all involvement or knowledge of the abduction and murder of Mary Lou Arruda. However, circumstantial evidence and chilling details about James Cater's past deepened suspicions. Cater smoked and was in possession of Benson and Hedges cigarettes, the same brand discarded at the scene of the kidnapping. The unique treadmark found also resembled a tire on Cater's green opal. Perhaps most disturbing of all, Cater had previously committed a crime eerily similar to Mary Lou's murder. Nine years earlier, Cater pled guilty to kidnapping and assault of another teenage girl. This victim didn't die, but nearly. She was 13 years old and walking her bike along the side of the road. He took her into the woods, bludgeoned her, and even forced her face into a stream. He then eventually tied her hands, neck, and feet to a tree and left her for dead. She managed to free herself after passing out briefly. Other suspicious activity from the suspect included him washing his car shortly after the time of the abduction, despite having done so the day before it as well. Inconsistencies between his alibi and witness testimony further degraded his claims of innocence. 
Before we go further, let's consider this mode of murder a bit more closely. When someone is restrained in the forest due to physical constraints, such as being tied to a tree, they face several risks related to exposure. Primary dangers include dehydration, hypothermia, or hyperthermia, depending on the weather. If additionally physically injured, further complications can occur. Being immobile increases vulnerability to the elements. For instance, cold temperatures can lead to hypothermia, while direct sunlight and high temperatures can lead to hyperthermia. Dehydration sets in without access to water, and the inability to move can result in pressure sores or worsen injuries. In severe cases, the restraints and position can restrict breathing, leading to asphyxiation. James Cater testified in his own defense at trial. He acknowledged he had committed the 1968 kidnapping and assault, but he vehemently denied any involvement in the murder of Mary Lou Arruda in 1978. He was found guilty, however, and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But as often happens with the cases we cover on this channel, this one wasn't quite done. The Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court overturned Cater's conviction. He was tried again for the murder in 1986 and again was convicted. Once more, the murder conviction was overturned by a higher court. By 1992, James Cater had retired. It was in this year he was again and for the final time tried and convicted for the murder of Mary Lou Arruda in 1978. He died of cancer in prison on January 23, 2016, 38 years after the murder of Mary Lou Arruda. She would have been 53 years old. From this grimness of the Bridgewater Triangle, venturing south of the Florissant Fossil Beds National Monument near Florissant, Colorado, surrounded by towering trees amongst the moss and the pine needles, a murdered woman's leg protruded from the ground, just waiting to be discovered. The day of June 4, 1933, began like any other for Paul Rhodes and Donald Good, two burly, sweaty gold prospectors who ventured into the forest in search of fortune. Their quest was abruptly halted when they discovered what appeared to be a woman's leg protruding from the earth. The area was covered in many small holes, prospecting holes. Upon closer inspection, they unearthed the broken, burned, and mangled body of a woman, setting into motion a series of events that would reveal a real murder mystery of love, deceit, cold-blooded murder in the forest. The Petrified Forest of Florissant in Colorado, not to be confused with the widely known Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona, is an area characterized by its ancient fossilized trees that turned to stone over millions of years. The Florissant fossil beds are a national park, and the murder that we are unraveling today serves as more than a scary national park mystery, but is also a cautionary tale of murder in the wilderness. The transformation of fossilization occurs through a process known as permineralization, where organic materials are replaced with minerals, preserving the original structure of the trees. These petrified remains are a testament to the geological history of the region, offering a window into the ancient past when these now stone trees were alive, thriving in a vastly different environmental context. The geographical areas surrounding the petrified forest, including the vicinity of Florissant and Cripple Creek, is part of the Colorado Rockies known for its dramatic landscapes, marked by mountains, forests, and valleys. This region has a rich history of mining and prospecting, especially during the Colorado Gold Rush of the late 19th century, which drew thousands of prospectors to the area in search of fortune. The small prospecting holes that crater the landscape where the body was found are remnants of this era, dotting the landscape like the scars of the dashed hopes of prospectors past seeking gold and fortune. Prospectors would dig these holes searching for signs of gold or other valuable minerals, creating a landscape that can seem almost otherworldly. These holes vary in size and depth, often abandoned once deemed unfruitful, leaving a patchwork of pits across the terrain. This region's history is a blend of natural wonder and human ambition, where the timeless beauty of the natural world meets the transient desires of those seeking fortune. The petrified forest, with its ancient trees turned to stone, stands a silent witness to the ebb and flow of life and the endeavors of those who ventured into its depths, seeking to carve out their own destiny among its petrified sentinels. The presence of these prospecting holes speaks to the enduring human spirit of exploration and the quest for prosperity, set against the backdrop of a landscape that has witnessed the passage of eons. This true crime case from history is part real-life mystery horror story and part detective story. Sheriff Ed Vineyard of Cripple Creek, a detective of some renown himself, was tasked with unraveling this enigma. He approached this case with a meticulousness that would become legendary. Initially, the victim's identity was obscured by the violence of her demise. Beaten and battered, her features were unrecognizable, her identity stolen by her assailant's brutality. The only clues to her past life were the remnants of her existence scattered around the shallow grave. 
the Paisley Shawl, a fragment of a Chicago newspaper dated May 11, 1933, and gasoline that failed to consume the evidence as the killer intended. Imagine walking through the foliage into this crime scene. The ground is uneven, littered with the ancient stone remnants of trees that have witnessed millennia. It's dotted with holes of varying sizes and ages. Among these natural and man-made relics, a disturbing incongruity presents itself. A human leg, clothed in silk, protruding with an unnatural angle from the ground of layered foliage and pine needles. The body lies in a shallow makeshift grave, not so much buried as concealed, an attempt to hide evidence of a heinous act. The initial observations reveal the violence inflicted upon her. She has been beaten, her skull fractured by blows that speak of a brutal struggle. Bruises adorn her head and face. She had several broken bones, breaking presumably as she was forced into the hole. Nearby, evidence of the murder's true location surfaces. Approximately 30 feet from where the body was found, the earth tells its own story. Blood-stained ground and disturbed foliage indicate the spot where the fatal encounter likely occurred. This spot, closer to a path, might have been where the perpetrator initially attacked our victim before moving her to a more concealed location. Intriguingly, the investigators discover tracks leading away from the scene, a pair of footprints made by the woman's French heels, distinct and telling. These tracks, with near certainty belonging to the dead woman herself, lead towards the area where her body was eventually found, suggesting that she had been chased and or dragged to the spot of her death. Her shoes found nearby corroborate this. Adding to the complexity, the crime scene is littered with personal artifacts and potential clues. Among these, the Paisley Shawl, half burned and discarded. Also found, a piece of Chicago newspaper dated May 11, 1933. This becomes an important clue for several reasons. First, it provides investigators with a temporal anchor, narrowing down when the crime might have occurred. Since newspapers are daily publications, finding a specific date on a fragment at a crime scene suggests that the events surrounding the murder likely happened around or after this date. Such artifacts can be particularly significant in cases where the exact time of death is difficult to determine due to the condition of the body and the nature of the crime scene. Second, the origin of the newspaper, Chicago, introduces a geographical element to the investigation. It hints at a possible connection between the victim, or perhaps the perpetrator, and the city of Chicago. This could suggest that either the dead woman or her murderer had been in Chicago close to the time of the killing. The victim had manicured nails, painted red, and other observations indicated this was a woman who may have been fairly well off. The post-mortem examination revealed several significant findings that were important to understanding the circumstances of her death. The examination indicated that the woman had been subjected to a violent assault. Her injuries consistent with the struggle. The cause of death appeared to be blunt force trauma, evidenced by the fractured skull, bruising on the face and head, and other injuries. Several of her fingernails were broken, and her thumb was broken and dangled loosely. These injuries suggest that she may have attempted to defend herself from the blows of her murderer. Postmortem findings indicate that she had been dead for a week or maybe even more by the time her body was discovered. All things considered, the investigators had unearthed some rich pieces of evidence, but investigations, even those that begin with promising leads and evidence, can falter or experience significant challenges due to a variety of factors. In this case, the evidence included a newspaper fragment, a paisley shawl, and the condition and location of the body. While these pieces of evidence were crucial, they also require interpretation and imply multiple possible general scenarios for the murder. For instance, a newspaper with a specific date perhaps helped narrow down the timeline with the right context, but it did not directly point to a suspect. Similarly, without modern forensic techniques, it was difficult to ascertain the significance of any physical evidence found at the scene. Evidence that might seem promising initially could sometimes actually raise more questions than answers, complicating or overwhelming some investigations. This investigation unfolded with a painful slowness. Every clue was pursued, every lead followed, yet months passed with little progress. The case seemed destined to join the silent sentinels of the forest. Sheriff Vineyard's resolve, however, did not wane. Leveraging some novel forensic science at the time, he embarked on a nationwide appeal for dental records. For 16 long months, the case remained cold. The identity of the woman and her killer were enigmas that seemed destined to remain unsolved. The breakthrough came when dental records provided by a dentist in Nebraska matched the dental characteristics of the body found in Colorado. Specifically, Dr. F. G. Rode of Columbus, Nebraska reported that the dental work he had performed matched the description of the dental evidence collected from the body. This match was corroborated by another dentist, adding further confirmation to the identification. This dual confirmation provided a strong basis for the identification of the victim. Her name, 
was Ida Hansen. The use of dental records to positively identify the victim was a relatively novel approach at the time. The matching of dental work performed on Ida Hansen by dentists in Nebraska was a turning point in the investigation, illustrating the evolving nature of forensic science and its growing importance in criminal investigations. During the early 20th century, when this case occurred, forensic science was in its nascent stages compared to the advanced practices and technologies available today. Several developments and methodologies were being introduced laying the groundwork for modern forensic science. But the field was still limited by the technology and knowledge of the time. Here's an overview of what forensic science looked like during this period and how it compares to today. By the early 20th century, fingerprinting had become a recognized and valuable method for identifying individuals, especially in criminal investigations. This was one of the first scientific methods to be widely adopted by law enforcement agencies. Photography was used to document crime scenes and evidence. Although not as sophisticated as today's digital imaging, it provided investigators with a visual record of the crime scene and could be used in court. The ability to determine blood types like A, B, AB, or O was discovered in the early 1900s. While this could not pinpoint an individual, it could exclude suspects whose blood type did not match the blood evidence. As we heard a bit about in our first case, the study of bullet trajectories and firearm identification was also emerging. Experts could match a bullet to a specific firearm based on unique markings, a process sometimes known as ballistic fingerprinting. Additionally, basic toxicological analysis could be performed to detect poisons and other substances in body tissues and fluids, aiding in investigations of poisoning cases. As demonstrated in the Petrified Forest murder case, dental records could be used for identifying victims when other physical characteristics were not discernible. But much of what we take for granted in criminal investigations today didn't exist back then. The most significant absence was DNA profiling, which wouldn't be developed until the 1980s. DNA analysis has revolutionized forensic science by allowing for precise identification of individuals from very small samples of biological material. Today, crime scene investigators use a variety of tools for detecting and analyzing evidence, including alternative light photography, 3D scanning, and luminol for detecting trace amounts of blood. These tools were not available in the early 20th century. Overall, forensic science during the period of the Petrified Forest murder case was marked by a reliance on the emerging scientific methods of the time, with a significant emphasis on observational skills and the basic scientific knowledge available. The advancements in forensic science since then have vastly improved the accuracy, efficiency, and scope of criminal investigations. Ida S. Hansen, the victim in this historical true crime case, was a Milner from Columbus, Nebraska. A Milner was someone skilled in the design, manufacture, and or sale of hats for women. This profession suggests that Ida was a creative individual with an eye for fashion and detail. Being a Milner during this time required not only artistic skills, but also business acumen. All indications are that Ida was an independent and capable woman. Investigators learned that Ida was relatively affluent, owning valuable securities worth at least $10,000, a considerable sum at that time. Of course, with identification of the body comes much needed context. Quickly, several critical pieces of evidence fell into place that led directly to a prime suspect, Charles W. Neal. Neal had developed a romantic relationship with Hansen, leading reportedly to their engagement. However, the investigation revealed that Neil's intentions were likely driven by financial gain. It turns out that he helped convince Ida to sell her business and assets. He wanted to marry her and start afresh somewhere else, so he said. The relationship was known to some acquaintances, and Ida had reportedly shared her plans to marry Neil and start a new life with him. Reports indicate that Neil had convinced Ida to sell her thriving millinery business and elope with him under the promise of marriage. However, his intentions were far from honorable. On the day Ida Hansen disappeared, Neil was reported to have been seen with Hansen, perhaps under the ruse of launching their new life together. Some interesting background came to light as well and revealed that Neil had previously operated a whiskey still near the location of the murder. Neil's familiarity with the area and his suspicious activity immediately focused the attention of law enforcement. His actions and statements regarding Ida Hansen's whereabouts and their supposed plans together were inconsistent and evasive. Neil was arrested and tried for murder. The evidence against him was largely circumstantial, but it was compelling. It included his known relationship with Hansen, the financial motive provided by her assets, his presence with her around the time of her disappearance, and his suspicious behavior before and after the murder. Circumstantial evidence, while not as directly convicting as modern forensic evidence like DNA, can be powerful in painting a comprehensive picture of the suspect's guilt when meticulously compiled and presented. 
During this era, circumstantial evidence carried more weight than it might be permitted to present day. Neal was found guilty of the murder of Ida Hansen. The jury, after considering the evidence presented, concluded that Neal was responsible for Hansen's death. He was sentenced to life in prison. While prison conditions before 1950 varied widely, depending on the location and the resources available, they were significantly harsher than today's standards. Some inmates were literally chained and caged. Physical abuse was common, and disease was prevalent. Many prisons were overcrowded, leading to inadequate living conditions, including poor sanitation and ventilation. This lack of space and sanitary facilities contributed to the spread of diseases among inmates. Neal served his sentence until his death, which actually wasn't long. He died May 20, 1936 of dropsy and pneumonia. Dropsy refers to an old term used for edema, a medical condition characterized by an excess of watery fluid collecting in the cavities or tissues of the body. Of course, pneumonia being infection that inflames the lungs, which can fill with fluid and pus. Quite unpleasant. Ida Hansen's murder in the petrified forest remains a poignant reminder of the human capacity for both love and cruelty. Her story and the restless pursuit of justice by Sheriff Vineyard continues to resonate as a testament to the enduring search for truth in the face of human darkness. <laughs>